Willie Hugh Nelson was born April 29, 1933. He is an American musician, actor, and activist. The critical success of the album Shotgun Willie, 1973, combined with the critical and commercial success of Red-Headed Stranger, 1975, and Stardust, 1978, made Nelson one of the most recognized artists in country music. He was one of the main figures of Outlaw Country, a subgenre of country music that developed in the late 1960s as a reaction to the conservative restrictions of the Nashville sound. Nelson has acted in over 30 films, co-authored several books, and has been involved in activism for the use of biofuels and the legalization of marijuana. Born during the Great Depression and raised by his grandparents, Nelson wrote his first song at age 7 and joined his first band at 10. During high school, he toured locally with the Bohemian Polka as their lead singer and guitar player. After graduating from high school in 1950, he joined the U.S. Air Force but was later discharged due to back problems. After his return, Nelson attended Baylor University for two years but dropped out because he was succeeding in music. During this time, he worked as a disc jockey in Texas radio stations and a singer in Honky Tonks. Nelson moved to Vancouver, Washington, where he wrote Family Bible and recorded the song, Lumberjack, in 1956. He also worked as a disc jockey at various radio stations in Vancouver and nearby Portland, Oregon. In 1958, he moved to Houston, Texas, after signing a contract with D Records. He sang at the Esquire Ballroom Weekly and he worked as a disc jockey. During that time, he wrote songs that would become country standards, including Funny How Time Slips Away, Hello Walls, Pretty Paper, and Crazy. In 1960, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and later signed a publishing contract with Pamper Music which allowed him to join Ray Price's band as a bassist. In 1962, he recorded his first album, and then I wrote. Due to this success, Nelson signed in 1964 with RCA Victor and joined the Grand Ole Opry the following year. After mid-chart hits in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, Nelson retired in 1972 and moved to Austin, Texas. The ongoing music scene of Austin motivated Nelson to return from retirement, performing frequently at the Armadillo World Headquarters. In 1973, after signing with Atlantic Records, Nelson turned to outlaw country, including albums such as Shotgun Willie and Phases and Stages. In 1975, he switched to Columbia Records, where he recorded the critically acclaimed album Red Headed Stranger. The same year, he recorded another outlaw country album, Wanted. The Outlaws, along with Waylon Jennings, Jesse Coulter, and Tompel Glazer. During the mid-1980s, while creating hit albums like Honeysuckle Rose and recording hit songs like On the Road Again, To All the Girls of Love Before, and Poncho and Lefty, he joined the country supergroup The Highwaymen, along with fellow singers Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, and Chris Christopherson. In 1990, Nelson's assets were seized by the Internal Revenue Service, which claimed that he owed $32 million. The difficulty of paying his outstanding debt was aggravated by weak investments he had made during the 1980s. In 1992, Nelson released the IRS tapes, Pool by My Memories, the profits of the double album destined to the IRS and the auction of Nelson's assets cleared his debt. During the 1990s and 2000s, Nelson continued touring extensively, and released albums every year. Reviews ranged from positive to mixed. He explored genres such as reggae, blues, jazz, and folk. Nelson made his first movie appearance in the 1979 film The Electric Horseman, followed by other appearances in movies and on television. Nelson is a major liberal activist and the co-chair of the advisory board of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, Normal, which is in favor of marijuana legalization. On the environmental front, Nelson owns the biodiesel brand Willie Nelson Biodiesel, which is made from vegetable oil. Nelson is also the honorary chairman of the advisory board of the Texas Music Project, the official music charity of the state of Texas.
uh, before I got out of high school, I started a band with me and my sister and my brother-in-law and my football coach, and uh, he played trombone. And we had a little family band. We played all over Texas. We played in uh, Waco and West, and then you know places that we could drive to with a, uh, a trailer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was with KHBR in Hillsboro, and uh, we had our own radio show there every Saturday, and. And then after that, I went to the Air Force and then went down to uh, Pleasanton, Texas, and went to work at KOB Pleasanton down there. And then I worked at several other radio stations. And at the same time, playing bars around, trying to make it. Uh, 49 uh, is when I graduated from high school in a band then. Well, first of all, it all happened uh, when uh, the Dixie, Dixie Chicks uh, was overseas when they... Uh, uh, said what they said that seemed to have upset everybody. I was overseas too at a press conference, and, and a lot of I guess the, they had it for the had it in for the Dixie Chicks more than they did me. I don't know because for they had every reason in the world to get on me also. Well, I don't know what they said. You know what about this crazy cowboy from Texas you got running your? I said first of all he's not a cowboy. Second of all he ain't from Texas. So uh, you know let's start there. Well, it did, and it took a while, and the chicks had to go through some uncomfortable times. But you know, they're tough, and uh, and uh, they came out on the other side of it really looking great, and uh, and they're more popular now than they were then, and a lot of it's because of that. So uh, you know, I don't know whether they'd rather have done it that way or not, but at least they said uh, what they thought, and they stuck with it. And I think their last record was, you know, we're not ready to make nice yet. And it was always a bad idea. You just don't start wars. And, uh, and again, it goes back to my uh, whatever I learned in Abba, Texas. Uh, uh, you just don't kill people. There's something in the Bible that says thou shalt not kill. And uh, and it's also a lot of things in there about peace on earth. And that's why I, I grew up believing that way. And then all of a sudden I found out there are huge organizations out there that are starting wars and selling bullets to both sides. And I said, what the hell is going on? What happened to peace on earth? And they've been winning ever since, uh, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, it talked about wars. There always be wars and rumors of wars, but in the new one, it said, let's talk about peace. And then there was, there, there's gonna be some peace. And I believe that there's, eventually there's gonna be peace on earth. And it's those other bastards that are getting in the way of it. So what do we do about them, Alex? Uh, we can't let it go on uh, another year. I mean, it has to... Uh, the other day I was getting the interview. Somebody said, what would you do if you were elected president? I said, I would stop the damn war. And uh, it's just that simple. You stop that war, you stop the other wars that we're in around the country. And you go around the country being a peacemaker and stopping wars. I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And, uh, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> you know, the way I heard it, there was 15 people from uh, Saudi Arabia hit us in New York, and we go jump on Afghanistan. Uh, I never could figure that one out in Iraq. Well, I did figure it out, too, but uh, I'm surprised more people haven't figured it out. And uh, I saw those towers fall, and I've seen the, an implosion in Las Vegas. Uh, there was too much similarities between the two. And then I saw the building fall. It didn't get hit by nothing. So... Uh, you know, how naive are we? Or, you know, what are, what do they think we'll go for? The day it happened, I saw one fall and it was just so symmetrical. And I said, wait a minute, I just saw that last week at the, you know, a, a casino over in uh, Las Vegas. And you see these implosions all the time. And then the next one fell and I said, hell, there's another one. And they're trying to tell me that an airplane did it. And that's, you know, I can't go along with that. True story, I guess. I hate to hear it, but it's probably true. The fact that there are a few elite that are running everything, calling the shots, starting the wars, financing them all, uh, I believe that. And uh, what else they're doing, uh, who knows? But uh, that one thing alone is enough to, for uh, us to think about how do we stop them. And uh, as far as I can see, all those people attended the same meetings that you and the guys attended up in Canada. Am I wrong? It's not democracy either. Well, the song that I wrote called Peaceful Solution, is uh, now they, uh, all those people that recorded it believe, and so do I, that there is a peaceful solution. And uh, it's called a peace revolution, and we just take back America. And we do it, vote it back, we do it, and we make sure that the 
crooked ballot boxes are thrown away. We get a paper trail and everything and make sure that good, honest people can get back in control. And that's the only way we're going to do it is to just do it. You know what I mean? I do believe that uh, it's a long time till election day and some sort of national crisis could put off the elections and we could have George in there 10 years longer. I would hope that uh, that we're, we'd be smarter than that and I would hope that we'd say no, we, you know, we're throwing all you guys out and we're starting over. Uh, you know, you can stop the elections if you want to, but you can't stop the people. Well, again, and the troops are under orders and if they don't know what they you know, uh, the orders are that they get shot. So uh, the, the troops have no choice. There's a few of them in there that are there because they think it's the right thing to do. There are a few there because they just like to fight. Uh, but there's a lot of them there, like you say, that would rather be home with their families and uh, save our good men and women for something that really matters, for really something that is the defense of our country. If we need some people down here on the borders, let's take 150,000 people out of Iraq and put them on the borders of Canada and Mexico. We can secure our borders that way. Uh, you know, they're fighting over there because, you remember the old joke about the guy that dropped a quarter and he was looking around and the guy said, where did you lose it? I said, I lost it over yonder. And he said, why are you looking over here for? He said, well, call the lights better. I think that's why they're over there, the lights better. There's, there's nobody stopping it. And as long as it keeps going on and nobody stops it, uh, I don't know what the end result will be. But to be good, it can't be good for us. Absolutely, ten times over, I remember. And I'm not sure I want to get treated ten times as bad as we're treating other people. So you just that just can't happen because everyone is an individual. We all have our free will, and God gives us, uh, you know, the freedom to uh, uh, to use it. So uh, no matter where we are, what we're doing, if we know it's wrong. We should not do it. I don't know where you grew up, but I grew up with a lot of people who really are, uh, you, you have to doubt if they have a conscience. And uh, I know they're all over the world, so I'm not surprised that people, you know, can torture because uh, I've seen it happen all my life in, you know, smaller degrees. But uh, there are just some people who are that way. They like to make the other person uncomfortable in whatever way they can. Yeah, I think it is. It's not money, it's about power. Oh, I like Ron Paul, but I think he's got the same troubles that Dennis had. Uh, first of all, he's, you know, there's not that much support. Uh, behind him, he is growing a little bit, but uh, I noticed his numbers had uh, he come up in, where was it, Maine here in the last day or so that he got quite a good, you know, I like what he says. Uh, I still think when we get down to it, it's going to be McCain and either Hillary or Obama. I, I was hoping that uh, Hillary had changed her mind. I was hoping Obama was all the way against the war. Uh, I don't know. Maybe public opinion can uh, keep their minds where they need to be. Well, you know, it's a, it's a no-brainer. you got to get rid of the voting machines because they're crooked or they can be hacked. And uh, uh, we can't afford to have another election stolen. I, that's, that's my question. Uh, you know, what, what do we have to see in order to change it? Because we know it's crooked. But since I know zero about machines, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that hard for them to fool me, uh, <laughs> you know, and... It's been it's done with pencil and paper. I, I get fooled with that too, but it's a little harder. <laughs> it happened uh, in the next day. I was I was somewhere doing a show, and somebody said, "What do you think about?" It? And I said, "Well, first of all, when I get hit, I like to look around and see who did it before I start swinging at everybody in the room." And it kind of looked like what we were doing. Uh, we get hit over here, and the next thing you know, we're jumping on everybody in the town. So. Uh, uh, we got hit from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think we have some questions that need to be answered from those folks. What does it take for us to realize that, you know, we're having the wool pulled over our eyes one more time? Well, first of all, I knew that, that there should be, uh, that, that it's the greatest uh, killer on the planet is stress, and the best medicine is cannabis and uh, for some people and uh, it's a good medicine so uh, first of all there was no reason to make it illegal unless you had an agenda and the same thing with uh, uh, the same thing with uh, with biodiesel and ethanol ethanol back in the, the 30s was 20 25 percent of the market with was ethanol the other 75 percent was standard oil 
So uh, once ethanol became a problem, what did they do? They came up with prohibition. They did two things. It stopped the farmer from growing and, and making ethanol because he was making ethanol in the same piece of equipment that he made his whiskey in, which was a still. So when they brought in prohibition and stopped the whiskey, they also stopped the making of ethanol and they put the farmers out of business who were making their own fuel. And uh, also uh, Standard Oil again won the battle. Well, it, it definitely happened to a lot of people, and uh, it put the ethanol people out of business the first time, and then the second time around, they put them out of business. And now they're they're trying to do it again, uh, and as oil goes up and up and up and up, uh, they're also looking at us over here who are into the alternative energies, and I've heard from the oil companies that, hey, you know, it's all right, you guys go ahead and do what you're going to do for the next 36 months or so, and then we're going to come in and take it over. And that would all be well and good, except that when that happens, I know it's not going to be good for the local producer and the local consumer. A lot of things will be imported, palm oil, for all over the world, and, and that's not good. Uh, until we can get it back to where uh, your family and my family can grow their own ethanol and their own biodiesel, uh, uh, and then our economy is going to stay bad. We have to bring it back to sustainable agriculture locally, and it's got to start locally. Well, the first diesel engine, Rudolf Diesel designed his first engine to run on peanut oil. So for all these years we've, that we've been using, uh, you know, oil and diesel, and we could have been using peanut oil. We could have been using all kinds of vegetable oils. Uh, we didn't have to become that dependent. So it was a uh, again, uh, it was a planned agenda to keep us away from the biodiesel because they wanted to sell us oil. At the same time, the government was using biodiesel and ethanol in its equipment because it was cheaper to produce and uh, the equipment ran better on it. But they didn't give it to the private sector because they wanted us to keep using oil. You know, when the cannabis thing and the marijuana uh, was made illegal back in those days, I traced it back to the petrochemicals again. And everything that was made from uh, cannabis now is made from petrochemicals. So uh, it's just uh, the oil companies again coming in and taking over and making marijuana illegal and uh, telling people it's crazy and uh, it'll uh, make, you know, it'll kill you and all that stuff. So far, I don't know of anybody that's died from marijuana unless a bail fell on them or something. Well, it's obvious again because everything that's made from petrochemicals at one time was made from cannabis. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, even the uh, the blue jeans. Uh, did you ever read a book called The uh, Emperor Wears and Has No Clothes that Jack Harrow wrote? Yeah, and it talks about the original Levi's being made from cannabis and uh, it talks about the, the uh, all the, the ships, the, the covered wagons, the canvas was made from cannabis. Yeah, and when I was in the, uh, when I was in high school in the FFA, uh, it was during the war, and they had us making rope out of hemp. They made hemp legal again back during the war because they needed it. And we were making hemp ropes in the gymnasium there in Abbott, Texas. Just too hard for them to compete against something that you can just throw out some seeds and uh, and that you got food, fuel, material, uh, everything you need in one in one seed, and that's just too much for them to compete with. Uh, you know, it doesn't. After all the other things that they've done, Ryan is certainly not going to stop them. Uh, if all it takes to cover up what they're doing is a little white lie, well, they'll, uh, you know, they'll paint the world with a little white lie. No, it's not the first time I've said it, and uh, uh, it won't be the last time. I just, I'm just saying what I believe. I, I'm not that brave, I don't think. I know I'm, I'm, maybe I'm too dumb to be scared, but uh, I just <laughs> believe in uh, saying what you really think, and that's always been what I did, and I've, you know, Sometimes that doesn't go well with other people, but they'll have to get over it. Well, I guess worst case scenario would be if we all had to go back to the way we grew up and grow our own food in our own gardens in the backyard or in our uh, pot plants or whatever. And uh, it's something we can do. And in fact, all over Houston, 
Uh, New York and cities now, people are using vacant lots and rooftops to grow, starting to grow their own vegetables. And uh, I think uh, the way things are going, we all should be thinking about how can we sustain ourselves if gasoline is too expensive or if there is no more or if the roads get cut off. There's the weather problems that we've had and uh, from all indications, uh, those things are going to get worse. The weather patterns are getting more severe. Yeah, and I do believe that the weather is going to be giving us more problems than anything else, and uh, uh, it's going to affect us every way possible. So we all may have to go back to the self-sustainment of uh, growing our own food and trying to find our own water. The act of God is causing us to do it. Uh, it may be weather patterns that makes us have to do it, but it's, again, uh, fortunately we're not in control. There's somebody up there taking care of us, and they'll make us go back to do and doing what we need to be doing. During the 1990s and 2000s, Nelson toured continuously, recording several albums including 1998's critically acclaimed Teatro, and performed and recorded with other acts including Fish, Johnny Cash, and Toby Keith. His duet with Keith, Beer for My Horses, was released as a single and topped the Billboard Hot Country Songs charts for six consecutive weeks in 2003, while the accompanying video won an award for Best Video at the 2004 Academy of Country Music Awards. A USA Network television special celebrated Nelson's 70th birthday, and Nelson released The Essential Willie Nelson as part of the celebration. Nelson also appeared on Ringo Starr's 2003 album, Ringo Rama, as a guest vocal on Write One For Me. Nelson was featured on the album True Love by Toots and the Maytals, which won the Grammy Award in 2004 for Best Reggae Album, and showcased many notable musicians including Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, Trey Anastasio, Gwen Stefani, No Doubt, Ben Harper, Bonnie Raitt, Manu Chow, The Roots, Ryan Adams, Keith Richards, Toots Hibbert, Paul Douglas, Jackie Jackson, Ken Boone, and the Scatolites. In the following year of 2005, Nelson released a reggae album entitled Countryman which featured Toots Hibbert of Toots and the Maytals on the song, I'm a Worried Man. Nelson headlined the 2005 Tsunami Relief Austin to Asia concert to benefit the victims of the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake, which raised an estimated $75,000 for UNICEF. Also in 2005, a live performance of the Johnny Cash song, Busted with Ray Charles was released and Charles's duets album Genius and Friends. Nelson's 2007 performance with jazz trumpeter Wynton Marsalis at the Lincoln Center, was released as the live album Two Men with the Blues in 2008, reaching number one in Billboard's top jazz albums and number 20 on the Billboard 200. The same year, Nelson recorded his first album with Buddy Cannon as the producer, Moment of Forever. Cannon acquainted Nelson earlier, during the production of his collaboration with Kenny Chesney on the duet, That Lucky Old Son, for Chesney's album of the same name. In 2009 Nelson and Marsalis joined with Nora Jones in a tribute concert to Ray Charles, which resulted in the Here We Go Again, celebrating the genius of Ray Charles' album, released in 2011. In 2010, Nelson released Country Music, a compilation of standards produced by T-Bone Burnett. The album peaked number 4 in Billboard's Top Country Albums, and 20 on the Billboard 200. It was nominated for Best Americana Album at the 2011 Grammy Awards. In 2011 Nelson participated in the concert Kapua for Japan, a fundraising event for the victims of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in Japan which raised $1.6 million. Nelson is widely recognized as an American icon. He was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame in 1993, and he received the Kennedy Center Honors in 1998. In 2011, Nelson was inducted to the National Agricultural Hall of Fame for his labor in farm aid and other fundraisers to benefit farmers. In 2015 Nelson won the Gershwin Prize, the Lifetime Award of the Library of Congress. In 2018 the Texas Institute of Letters inducted him among its members for his songwriting. He was included by Rolling Stone on its 100 Greatest Singers and 100 Greatest Guitarists lists.
Why did you decide to do Farm Aid? Well, I was watching uh, the Live Aid show when it was on a few years back, and I heard Bob Dylan say, wouldn't it be nice if some of this money went to the American family farmer? And so then I started listening to some of the people going up and down the highway playing shows and listening to talking to some of the farmers and I began to see what a problem there was. I knew the farmers, like we talked about earlier, the farmer never has gotten as much as he should get for what he does and for the hours that he puts in. But uh, I didn't realize that it had gone to the extent that it had, where they were just uh, seemed to be this big, huge conspiracy by big business to run out the little guy. And uh, not only was it a conspiracy, it's one that's, that's happening even as we speak. We're losing 100000 a year. So uh, since, the ni since the 1985 farm bill that was supposed to have solved all the problems, we've lost a half a million farmers. So there is a big problem. Didn't solve many problems, that bill. No, no, no. Uh, is there a Farm Aid 5 in the future? Well, I don't rule it out. I would think that uh, uh, absolutely, if it's necessary to, uh, to take care of it, you know, uh, to keep the issue up front, sure. uh, then we would do one. Uh, I keep thinking that uh, the people who can do something about it, the people in Washington, D.C., uh, I keep thinking as they will if enough pressure is put on them. So uh, that's what we're trying to do is to uh, try to get the people out there who eat food to know more about where it comes from and uh, put the pressure on their uh, representatives in Washington to make sure that they get good healthy food and the best way to, to be assured of that is to have it done by a small family farmer, the guy That's who right. loves the land. That's right. Let's, let's talk about Country Music Cowboy Television Network. You want to talk about it? Well, yeah, it's one of those Why? things. Why did you go into the, to the network? Why did you go into a country music television network? Why is that? Well, a guy come to me and says, uh, what do you think about a cowboy, uh, cowboy network? I said, sounds great. Uh, he said, well, why don't we start one? So uh, I said, well, okay, go get the money. And uh, that's where he's at now. He's getting it. <laughs> he's um, still looking. What can we expect to see on, on CTN? What kind of uh, network is going to be? What? Well, my idea of the way it should look uh, would be good music and good movies 24 hours a day. So, uh, and that's, you know, what I envision having on there. And uh, so far, uh, it's, it's been, uh, you know, sort of touch and go, getting all the finances together, but it's still a good idea. And if it is a good idea, if it's a good enough idea, it'll happen. Sure. Or it could be available all over the United States? It would be available all over the world. All over the world? Right. Very good. It would be up there on the satellite and they could find it That's right. anywhere. And they go around the world. How about Willie Nelson, the Highwayman, along with Mr. Jennings, Mr. Cash, and Mr. Christofferson? How did the idea come about for the Highwayman? Uh, well, actually, the original Highwayman album uh, came about because of uh, the fact that we were in Switzerland doing a Christmas show. Uh, the four of us with uh, Johnny Cash there, and it was his Christmas show we were doing it. I think it was Geneva somewhere. And uh, we talked about doing an album together with me and John, and then it got to be maybe me and John and Waylon together, and then why not all four of us? And then so the next thing you know, we uh, we did the first Highwaymen album. And the Highwaymen albums have been accepted in the heart of the fans? Oh yeah, it seems to be. And uh, the Highwayman Great. 2 album it seems to be doing good. We've done a t uh, one tour we, uh, that was uh, a lot of fun. We're doing another one uh, in a few weeks. So uh, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun and it was a, a good idea. I'm not exactly sure whose idea it was, but it was a good one. Who writes the songs for the Highwayman album? You, Just various the songs writers? come around and uh, we pick the songs we like and uh, we'll go do them. How did the label Outlaw come about? back, you know, in the early days, I guess. Oh, I think it, uh, it all went back to the time when they were trying to, you know, label people, and uh, it seemed to be a commercial label. They found a way to uh, call, you know, one era of music there, uh, put a label on it, call it outlaw music. And What was uh, the difference in outlaw music as opposed to country music or regular country music or... I read an article where it said, uh, I read an article that said the outlaws shot the music full of holes and adrenaline. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> well, I don't know, but it, uh, 
the guys that I was involved with back then, with Chris and Waylon and Roger and Leon Russell and all these guys, uh, Billy Joe Shaver and Tom T. Hall and David Allen Coe, all these guys are uh, very talented. And, and when all of us get together in one spot and perform, uh, it, it's, it draws a lot of people and calls a lot of attention to our music. And that was really the reason that we had the first Fourth of July picnic was to get all these so-called outlaws together in one spot. That was that's quite a picnic. That's an annual event now, isn't it? Well, it's sort of an annual. We had the seventeenth one uh, 17th? this last July. Yeah. I hear about them, but that's yeah. How about Willie Nelson, the movie maker? We have nine movies. Yeah. So what's the most famous movie so far? Out of all. The well, movies? my favorite is Barbarossa. I still think that's. Is it? Yeah. What's the story with the redheaded stranger? That was. Uh, that was probably maybe my second favorite. I don't know. Songwriter maybe is in there somewhere. But Redheaded Stranger was uh, one of those uh, one of those things that I had to do. You know, it was uh, the album. I had to do the album, and then while I was doing the album, I was thinking about how we we're going to do the movie. So uh, uh, now the movie is done, and it did whatever it did. But anyway, it was something I had to get out of my system. And the movie was 1975, and from that movie, you had Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. Right. And Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain uh, was a was a phenomenal song for you. Yes, it was. Uh, the song was in the album, Red Headed Stranger album, and uh, was actually a hit before, long before the movie came out. Was it? Yeah. The Red Headed Stranger, that goes back to 1953? The song goes back? That's when that song was written. Well, who, who sang that song originally? Well, it was written by... Uh, a guy named Carl Stutz and uh, a lady named Elizabeth something. Oh, okay. And she not only wrote Red Headed Stranger, she also wrote a, a song that's on my new album was coming out, it's a song called uh, Little Things. Uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful lady, she was a wonderful lady. Anyway, that's that's when that was written. And uh, the first record on it was by, that I heard was a guy named uh, Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith. Now I play his music on the radio. He's excellent, isn't he? Yes, he is. Ooh. And, and uh, he was the first uh, guy that I ever, his band, I'm not sure who the singer was, but it was on his, he's, his record. He's basically instrumental, isn't he? Well, yeah, he plays a lot of bluegrass instrumentals, and, and uh, but he had a guy who sang The Red-Headed Stranger, and uh, uh, it was under Guitar Boogie Smith. And let's talk about Willie Nelson, the singer. Did it, it all started back in 57? when you were um, recorded a couple songs or was it before that, sort of? Well, I, I started singing, I was very young. It was, uh, 57 was, I guess, the first uh, album that I got. recorded two singles, No Place For Me and Lumberjack, out in Vancouver, right. Pencil, in Vancouver right. Washington. That's right, yeah. And then came Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain in 75. Actually, there was one called The Storm Has Just Begun that I, that I wrote and recorded back then that, uh, Probably me and a couple more guys are the only ones that's ever seen it or heard it. What was your first number one hit song? Blue Eyes? Uh, no, a song that I wrote called Family Bible. That was the first one before Blue Eyes? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, that was back in uh, 1959. Uh, what, what's your most popular LP? Your album, the most popular album that sold the most? I guess it would be Stardust. Uh, it's, uh, it's been out for over 10 years now, and it's, uh, it's stayed, still popular. It stayed on the charts for a long time. It's still on the charts. It, it, it's back in, yeah, it jumped out for a week or two, but it's back in uh, Billboard now. It's been in there over 10 years now. You sing a lot of duets with different, different yeah. Uh, yeah. like Merle was, uh, did Punch on Lefty with right. did the whole album with him, didn't you? Right. Um, who else did you sing with? Oh, uh, I don't know. I sang with a, a whole a lot of people. You know. What's the advantage of singing with duets with other entertainers? That they're just they're. I enjoy singing with the good singers, and uh, the fact that we're all on separate labels makes it a little difficult sometimes. But uh, uh, I, I think it's it's good when all the good singers can get together and sing together. Uh, so that's all really all I'm trying yeah. to do is just uh, sing with some of my favorite singers. A lot of your music hit the pop <coughs> charts. Was it intended to hit the pop charts, or did, was it? Or is it, you know, crossed over from country to pop? But did you well? Do you write songs to be on pop charts, or is it just no went that way? No, I just write songs, and uh, the fact that Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain got played on a pop chart, I thought was uh, was, it was an incredible thing to happen for its time there because there was uh, it's 
as country a song, and that arrangement that we did was as country and simple as it could be. And uh, the fact that it was played on pop stations just convinced me what I had sort of suspected, that good music is accepted everywhere. Good philosophy. Good philosophy. So far, you have had 35 plus albums out, 17 gold, 8 platinum, 4 multi-platinum. I'm, I, yeah. You know I more, way more about me than I do. <laughs> I do my, I'm doing my homework. <laughs> you sure, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> Blue, Stardust, uh, we just said that, Stardust was the longest album on the, on the charts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awards. What was the most prestigious award you've ever received? Today. Oh, I don't know. I would hate to uh, no, start no, listing no, them as just, one, two, three, okay. four. Uh, I think they, are, they were all very uh, appreciated and, and they were all significant in their own way. Have you had any unusual ones? Oh, I guess uh, the Indian of the Year Award was, uh, was a nice one. That was a few years back. 1973, Songwriters Hall of Fame. That, must, that, that was, was a, a prestigious. Nice one, yeah. And 1979, the CMA Entertainer of the Year. That was, yeah, that's, that was me. <laughs> that, that was you, all right. How about Playboy Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah, I like that one also. <laughs> and how about 1983, the Lifetime Achievement? That that's must have, that's you know, a, yeah, a National Academy of Popular Music. Yeah. You were the first country artist ever to be honored and the fourth only recipient of that award. That, that was how about Willie Nelson, the songwriter? You've been referred to as, by Mr. Chet Atkins, one of the greatest. And Mr. Tom T. Hall referred to you as the Shakespeare of country music. Now that's, that's saying a lot. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is, huh? Okay. Well, I'll have to respect these guys a bit. Yeah, they're I, very intelligent I, people. You know? <laughs> what song established you as a songwriter in Nashville? Uh, Hello Waltz. Uh, you wrote Hello, Farron Young? Yeah. 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 In 1961. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, what was your first number one song for somebody else? It was Hello Waltz. What, where did uh, actually, no, I'll take it back. It was Family Bible. Uh, uh, I wrote it and uh, sold it for $50. And then watched it go up the charts and become number one by Claude Gray. Claude Gray. Mm -hmm. That was back in 1959. Him. I don't recall him. Uh, what song to date that you wrote have been recorded by, by the other artists the most? You I guess Funny How Time Slips Away or Nightlife or Crazy. Those three have been recorded uh, almost a hundred times each, I guess. That's so. Did what you wrote, let me see, did you write the first song that was recorded back in 57 that you sang? Did you write those two originals back that you recorded in Vancouver? No Place Washington? to Go and Lumberjack? Yeah. I wrote No Place to Go. Lumberjack was written by Leon Payne. Oh, that's right. I did read that. Mm -hmm. How about Willie Nelson, the DJ, back in the 50s? Mm -hmm. you, why did you go into the DJ business? That was well, it was, uh, it was a way to stay in the music business. Uh, even though I, you know, I wasn't actually playing it, I was still playing it yeah. and playing the records. And I enjoyed doing it. it was, I still enjoy doing it. I think uh, you know, one of these days I'll get me another disc jockey show. Yeah. <laughs> when you're in Jersey, come up and help us, uh, help us out. Odd job. You taught Sunday school and played honky-tonk bars at night, huh? Mm -hmm. I bet that clashed, didn't it? Well, I was singing to a lot of the same people. <laughs> <laughs> you even went as far as entertaining presidents in the White House. That's right. Who did you enter? What presidents did you entertain? Uh, Jimmy Carter, and uh, he's still a very good friend of mine. How many nights a year are you on the road? Well, we still do a couple hundred days a year, and then uh, studio for a while, and then do maybe a movie or two a year. And, uh, that keeps everybody pretty busy. What do you do to relax? Uh, I like to play golf. Do you? Yeah, and uh, I'm a runner. I like to run. I like to ride horses. Mm -hmm. uh, What's ahead for Mr. Nelson? You've done quite a bit in your day. Oh, I'm just getting started. Okay, yeah. that's. I like that attitude. <laughs> I like that attitude. Yeah. You know, I was. Uh, I was reading in the in the one of the magazines I just received on May, uh, May 26th, the Billboard list of the top country artist album singles of the decade, meaning the 1980s. The top LPs, number four, was always on my mind of the decade. And top singles, the number one song, always on my mind, and the number four song was To All the Girls I've Loved Before.